Coming up on Stu Does America, Catherine Price returns to tell us how to stop being such miserable jerks all the time and have a little fun. Andrew Cuomo's scam book profits go bye-bye and the justice continues to roll in. The holidays are growing ever closer, so be sure you're taking advantage of our special merch deal while you can. If you use the promo code STU20, you'll get 20% off everything in our store, stewdoesmerch.com. And the left has made the author of the Harry Potter series into a dementor of their very own for daring to speak her mind in public. Let's take the invisibility cloak off the situation as we do. J.K. Rowling. Full disclosure, I've never seen Harry Potter. I've never seen any of the movies. I've never read any of the books. I have literally no interest whatsoever in any of it. I don't want to go to Harry Potter World. I think that's a part of an amusement park somewhere. I don't care about it at all. Not only have I never seen it in the past, I will never see it in the future. I don't actually know what a Dementor or an Invisibility Cloak is. My producer is actually prepared for the show, and he knows, and he put it in there, and I hope I hope that made sense because I don't know what I was saying. Um, it's important for you to know this because I have no allegiance to J.K. Rowling at all. I don't care about J.K. Rowling. I think she's has a great story. She's obviously been very successful. Uh, I'm, I, you know, I like that she speaks her mind. That's about my beginning and end with J.K. Rowling. Um, but it's so fascinating to watch what is happening to her in the media and how she's being just attacked constantly. It's just, honestly, it's just really weird. It's a very strange part of our society how this person who, by all, uh, by all accounts, overcame an impossible you know, life story uh, to become the most successful female author of all time. And now we're just supposed to hate her, I think, because she says really nasty things. And she said this really nasty thing uh, today, or was it was yesterday, uh, on, on the Twitters, which... Look, whenever you're on Twitter, you know there's going to be a good outcome of whatever you're doing there. That's one rule about Twitter. There's never any negative consequences and always positive consequences. Remember that, boys and girls. J.K. Rowling responding to a, 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 um, a news story about the absurdity of the police logging rapists as women. She writes, war is peace. Freedom is slavery. Ignorance is strength. The penist individual who raped you is a woman. Now, this is, as she knows at this point, right, is going to get her in trouble, and she doesn't care. We'll get into that in a little while. But it's fascinating to see how, how anyone could think that that's controversial. You might think it's a little insensitive. You might think, ah, just why are you even bothering talking about it? There's a hundred things you can think of. But if, um, if a person with a penis rapes you and then claims they're a woman... It just feels like common sense to point out the absurdity of that moment. You might think uh, all sorts of trans rights issues are really important. That's good for you. It might be, it may, may very well be a focus of yours. But when someone is raping someone else, uh, I don't know. I feel like we get these little semantic games out of the way and we make sure that the person who's the victim of that crime uh, is taken care of. Well, if you think that maybe she was just kind of Looking at this rule and, and, and uh, exaggerating it in some crazy way, let me give you the details. The debate comes in the midst of the plans to reform the Gender Recognition Act, which would make it easier for trans people in Scotland to be legally recognized by their true gender identity. True gender identity. You might look at that phrase and say, are they saying you know, the, the gender that they were born with? No, they're saying the opposite of that, whatever they're saying. In part, the new policies would remove medical checks for those seeking a gender recognition certificate and shorten the time frame people must live as their gender identity before it's legally recognized. Should the new laws take effect, anyone facing rape allegations would indeed be recorded as a woman if they were biologically born male but self-identify as a woman, even if they don't have a full gender recognition certificate. Now, to, to boil this down, what J.K. Rowling is saying is legitimately what this law does. 
which would be that if a man raped a woman and was arrested, that man could say he was a woman and number one, throw off every crime statistic imaginable. I mean, I don't know how we'd learn anything about crime in this world because men can just say they're women and then it would be recorded as a woman raping another woman with her penis. That is legitimately what they're talking about. In addition to that, the man with the man parts could very well be put into prison with other women. So a rapist that's a man identifies as a woman and then gets put in prison with other women. Does anyone see why that might be more of a problem than misgendering someone? Is there anyone out there that can recognize how that could be an issue? Now, of course, obviously, as any idiot on the planet knows, this does not mean that every person who claims they're a trans is some sort of sexual predator. How would you even get that out of what I just read or what she tweeted? Well, seemingly every trans activist on Earth got exactly that out of what J.K. Rowling tweeted. Let me give you a few um, examples of this. Rodrigo Heng Lenthian, executive director of the National Center for Transgender Equality, said she had, meaning J.K. Rowling, had an incredible platform and she is using it to hurt transgender people. Imagine what it must mean to a young transgender person falling in love with her novels, only to learn that the author uses her tremendous power to attack your humanity. Huh? We are see seeing a record-breaking number of murders of transgendered people. We've gone through those statistics before. We don't have time to do it again, but that is, uh, you know, it's wrong on a hundred different uh, levels. Rowling's tweets add to the dangerous false narrative that transgender women are predators. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? She's not saying that every transgender person is going to go rape someone. Of course not. At no point does she even imply anything near that. She's just saying that a man could identify as a woman and have all sorts of problematic treatments within the legal system, not to mention crime statistics, that would create massive problems here. She's not, at no point is she saying every transgender per person is a predator. Also, she says, um, and, and this is on this previous quote that we just went over, but imagine, uh, imagine what it must mean to a young transgender person falling in love with her novels only to learn that the author uses her tremendous power to attack your humanity. She's talking about rapists. I mean, if you are a young person who is reading her novels and upset that your humanity is attacked, you would have to be a rapist. She was attacking rapists. If you are a rapist enjoying her novels, I'm not all that concerned as to what humanity is attacked. I'm more uh, uh, concerned about the actual human that was attacked in the assault than I am the novel reader who might feel a little upset about the situation. And, you know, these activists go back and forth. It's hard to even understand what they're saying sometimes, and they continually disagree with each other. Let, this is, uh, let me give you, this is uh, just a sampling here. Uh, Yahoo uh, News put this particular sampling together with no irony. Whatsoever. They didn't see anything strange about anything that they wrote. As a woman of transgender experience, this is one activist, I am going to ignore this increasingly irrelevant attention horror and enjoy my self identified life as the woman I am. Okay, so J.K. Rowling, you know, she's, she's an attention whore. Now, why on earth would J.K. Rowling need more attention? I don't know, but she's apparently an attention whore and she's increasingly irrelevant. She means nothing. Just brush her to the side. Who needs her, right? As a survivor of sexual assault, I'm outraged that J.K. Rowling has once again used her enormous platform to cause harm and to conflate, uh, conflate uh, transgender identity with rape. Now, of course, she didn't conflate transgender identity with rape. It's very important that you know that. But also, she, is she increasingly irrelevant or does she have an enormous platform? Is she increasingly irrelevant or does she, uh, she uh, let's see, um, an incredible platform uh, tremendous power to attack humanity, or is she increasingly irrelevant? Which one is it? Can we decide? Can we come up with some sort of arrangement here to understand? What's interesting about J.K. Rowling, I think more than anything else, is not really her opinions. I mean, she seems to be not a conservative, but uh, a feminist who just thinks you know women are, are under attack under this sort of new way of doing business. And she likes to point that out. 
And what she's saying is certainly not dramatic. I mean, saying that someone with male parts that rapes you should be considered a man is not exactly, uh, you know, some innovative observation here. It's basic understanding of all humanity, uh, and it's been the same since the beginning of time, okay? She's not asking for something crazy here. This is very, very basic. But for some reason now, we've come to a point where this is almost impossible for people to do. To just say, you know what? Truth is truth, and I'm not going to go along with, with this craziness right now. Uh, I'm going to uh, I'm gonna stand up, and I'm just going to say no. This is insane, and I'm not going down this road with you. And she's willing to come out and talk about it. Now, part of this is because uh, J.K. Rowling has an unlimited amount of money. Uh, she, she, she has a money, money printing machine and fears no one. I mean, this is something that happens uh, throughout life. And it, there's about seven stages of wealth. Let's go through this here real quick. The seven stages of wealth. Uh, number one is survival, okay? You start off, you're trying to make enough money to feed yourself, to feed your family, to be able to have shelter, to live. That's number one, okay? And it's interesting, at, when you're on uh, the survival level, you are just trying to, to, to keep your heart beating and your lungs bringing air in and out. I mean, that is what you're doing. And you see this in some of these uh, countries where, uh, you know, the economy is destroyed. You know, if you're in Syria right now, or actually, great example, unfortunately, is Afghanistan. We've left it in complete disarray. People there are just trying to survive. So number one is survival. Number two is struggle. You're trying to make it. You feel like you're falling behind all the time. Probably you've been in some period in your life where you went through that. The third level is stability. You have a place to live. You might have a job. You might be able to pay the bills, but barely. You're not flourishing. You're still just, you know, you're... You're not going to you're not going to starve, but you don't feel like you're flourishing and getting ahead. Next up is comfort. You're getting a little bit ahead. Maybe you have a little bit of money in the bank. Maybe you have a little bit of money in that 401k. Then you get to excess. And excess means maybe you're taking nice vacations. Maybe your car is pretty sweet. Maybe you've got some extra rooms in the house. Maybe you've got uh, an, uh, you know, the new laptop. You're starting to get to a point where you can appreciate some material uh, material things. Then you go to generational wealth. And generational wealth is, it's not just enough money for you, but you know your kids are gonna start off at a good spot. Maybe your, your kids, your grandkids are going to uh, be able to get a really good head start. And that is, you know, what most people strive for, honestly. You wanna get to that point where you can, I mean, why do you show up to work every day? You probably show up to work every day to make sure that your kids can have the things that they need, that you can still have fun with them, you can do things, you don't have to worry about finances. And in the long run, they'll be able to inherit some of your wealth, maybe your grandkids will have some of that as well, and the multiple generations of your family you're trying to take care of. But that's not where J.K. Rowling is. J.K. Rowling surpassed that long, long ago. She has gone to the seventh level of wealth, F you money. She's got more money than you can possibly have, and I, th she just no longer cares what you think. She can say whatever she wants, whenever she wants, and she doesn't care if you take, try to take all of it away from her. She's got enough to not care. Uh, Elon Musk has enough to not care. Can we put up the seven uh, steps again? Because I want to go through this. Keep these on the screen for a second, if you would, if that's possible. Because when you have FU money, you don't care. But what's interesting here is at the very top in FU and at some level generational wealth, you don't care about what you say. You don't care if you get canceled. You're already there. You're going on for the rest of your life and, and you don't care anymore. The same thing sort of applies to the very bottom end of the scale. When you're at the survival level, you don't really care. You'll say whatever you have to say, and it doesn't really matter. It's those middle sort of areas where you think you're doing pretty well. You're striving to make your, give your kids a better life, and then you can get shot down for something you could believe. And that's the vast majority of people that aren't at the very bottom in survival mode, and they're not at the very top in FU money. Those people in the middle are trying to have a voice in this republic and uh, often are being punished for that. So thank God for people like J.K. Rowling, whether you agree with her or whether you don't. It's okay if you think she's insensitive. It's okay if you think she doesn't go far enough. Whatever you happen to think about J.K. Rowling, um, and you may think she's wrong on every other issue. We need people who don't care. 
We need people who don't give a crap about people's feelings. They're just going to say what they want to say. And J.K. Rowling has that sort of level of cash. But I want to emphasize something here. And, and it comes as most important life lessons do from the movie Office Space. And this is a moment in Office Space where we understand a very important lesson when it comes to our level of wealth and cancellation sort of conversation here today. Watch this important moment of film. What would you do if you had a million dollars? I'll tell you what I'd do, man. Two chicks at the same time, man. <laughs> That's it? You had a million dollars, you'd do two chicks at the same time? Damn straight. I always wanted to do that, man. And I think if I were a millionaire, I could hook that up, too, because chicks dig dudes with money. Well, not all chicks. Well, the type of chicks that double up on a dude like me do. Good point. Well, what about you now? What would you do? Besides two chicks at the same time? Well, yeah. Nothing. Nothing, huh? I would relax. I would sit on my ass all day. I would do nothing. Well, you don't need a million dollars to do nothing, man. Take a look at my cousin. If he's broke, don't do That is the lesson that's important to understand here. A lot of us feel like, hey, we got to have uh, J.K. Rowling money to step up because we won't care about the rest of our lives uh, being canceled. We've, we've got it all. All the problems are solved in our lives, which I'm sure she wouldn't agree about in her life. But you don't need to have a million dollars to do what she's doing. And I find I'm so encouraged by the audience of this show, of the radio show, of the blaze in general, because it's made up overwhelmingly of people who are not in the J.K. Rowling category, but still go out there every day and speak their minds. You don't have to be a millionaire to do nothing, but you don't have to be a millionaire to speak your mind either. And in fact, the more people who do it, who cross that line, who say, you know what? I'm not going to be silent. I'm going to speak out. I don't care. I'm going to do it anyway. The more people who do it, the easier it is. It's, you can't cancel everybody here. We all walk together. If we all walk together toward the truth, they can't stop us. So that's the lesson here, I think, uh, that J.K. Rowling can, can teach us with her you know, $97 trillion and what office space can, can teach us. If we all walk together, they can't stop all of us. Ladies and gentlemen, take a quick look in the mirror. Do you have bags under your eyes? Uh, what if you wanted to see them gone, disappeared? Uh, you can get rid of those bags and puffiness under your eyes uh, just in time for the holiday season with GenuCell's plant stem cell therapy for bags and puffiness under the eyes. And with GenuCell's immediate effects, you're going to see results in the first 12 hours guaranteed or your money back. So you might be you know, honestly, you hear these claims all the time. You might be skeptical of them. Well, you don't have to be because there's no risk. They're going to give you your money back if you don't see these results. Uh, there's only two weeks left for GenuCell's Christmas and holiday season sale. This is a great gift. Uh, I love giving this to my mom. She is always asking for more. Um, it's important, uh, you know, to, to come up with a gift that doesn't suck. And GenuCell can do this for you. GenuCell's most popular package is 60% off right now at lovegenucell.com slash stew. Lovegenucell.com slash stew. Treat yourself or a loved one to the absolute best skincare in the world. Go to lovegenucell.com slash stew. Enter my promo code stew. You'll get an extra special holiday present. Order now and get free priority shipping for delivery by Christmas. It's love, G-E-N-U-C-E-L dot com slash stew. Lovegenucell.com slash stew. Check it out. So it's great to have Catherine Price on the program. Her new book is The Power of Fun, How to Feel Alive Again. And it's coming out next Tuesday. Be sure to reserve your copy today. You can pre-order it. Catherine, how's it going? It's going pretty well. How are you doing? It's always nice to be here. Yeah, thanks so much for uh, coming on and doing this. I appreciate it. I've been reading the book. And um, I will say at times I feel a little seen. Uh, as you're going through this. Let me give you a, a quote from the book. Uh, when we've been conditioned to believe that our time is too valuable to waste, and yet we often wind up spending our leisure hours on things that make us feel like we've wasted our time. I, every person I know in my life would relate to that uh, statement. We Sometimes when we have free time, we wind up doing things that at the end of the day don't fulfill us at all. 
in the book, you talk about the concept, uh, not just of fun, but of true fun and fake fun. Can you walk people through this? Sure. Yes. I realized one that when I was researching the book that our, we use the word fun really casually to the point that it's almost sloppy. And as a result, we're very vulnerable to anyone who wants to sell us their product or an activity as fun. If they do so, we'll accept it without questioning it. But if you actually think about it, there's a real difference between the activities that make us feel joyfully alive, which is really how I define true fun, and those that leave us feeling vacant and empty afterwards. And I call that fake fun. The number one culprit for that is definitely social media for a lot of people. And it's very similar to junk food, where you get this initial hit of pleasure from it, but then you are driven to compulsively consume it, and afterwards you feel gross and empty. So that's what we're trying to reduce or eliminate as much as possible. Yeah, it's really, it's an interesting idea, because you think, I mean, fun feels in a way like a bad word. Uh, you know, I, I think like a good portion of the book is re rehabbing some of these words, I feel like, like fun and playfulness uh, and play. These are words that I think like as adults, we think you're not supposed to do those things, but you make a pretty compelling case that they're really important parts of life. They're huge parts of life. They're hugely important. And yes, I think we tend to dismiss fun as frivolous, but over the past two years of researching and writing about fun, I've come to conclude that they're actually essential for our happiness and health. Like fun is essential. I define it as the combination of playfulness and connection and flow. And when I do that, a lot of people freak out, like you just said, at the playfulness component, because as adults, we think of play as a children's thing. You know, I personally, like, if you tell me that, I'm going to think about charades and let me tell you, I hate charades. But what I mean by it, what I invite everyone to embrace the idea of is just having a lighthearted attitude where you don't care too much about the outcome. You're not trying to be perfect. You're just doing things for the pleasure of it. And in terms of connection, anything that brings us closer together and brings out our shared humanity is good, not just for us, but for the world. And I think fun has the capacity to do that, to do that too. When you're having fun with someone, you're connecting on a human level that bridges all other divides. Uh, you talk about how the, the, the true fun concept, I think, was, is interesting. And everybody's had these moments where, you know, you describe it, a, you know, a moment in the car, like, you know, screaming, uh, you know, uh, Bohemian Rhapsody with your friends, right? Like, there's that moment where, like, you kind of remember it. And it's this really, uh, you have a real burst of energy, and it's, it's a real meaningful event, which is different than, like, you know, I would say, like, to have some fun, relax, I might go out and have a drink, I might go out uh, to see a movie. There are things I enjoy doing, but that's not exactly what you're describing here. Yeah, exactly. So I think there's three categories. You've got true fun, the memories, the activities, the moments that make you feel truly joyfully alive that you will remember for a long time because they light you up inside. Then you have fake fun, which is the junk food stuff we were just talking about. Then you have this whole middle category of activities that you truly do enjoy and that are worth your time, but they're not necessarily fun in the sense of the word that I'm talking about. They're probably relaxing or enjoyable in some other way. And that doesn't mean that they're bad. That very well might mean that you do want to do them. But I think it's interesting to start to tease out the differences between enjoyable hobbies that relax us and nourish us in a kind of a quiet way and the feeling of fun, which really energizes us and really does boost our resilience, which I think all of us could use right now. Hmm. You know, it's, it's interesting when you talk about the concept of fun. I think everybody would say, of course, obviously, I want to have fun. That would be great. I mean, I, you know, there's a lot going on in my, in my day from day to day. It's hard to find the time for it. But like, you know, I, I think it actually is really difficult to do. Uh, as an adult, uh, you know, I constantly, every once in a while I have a, a conversation with someone and they'll be like, well, so what's your, what are your hobbies? And I just stare at them blankly and I have absolutely no answer <laughs> Or them. And afterward, every time that happens, I have this moment of like, gosh, that's really sad. I, I didn't even have an answer to that question. And then I move on with my life and never think about it again until I pick up your book. So why, <laughs> why, is, that, uh, why is that important? And how do people get themselves in the mindset to actually uh, do this? Because it's, a, it's in some ways, as an adult, a task to figure out how to have fun. Well, if it starts feeling like too much of a task and a burden, then then jump ship because you're doing it wrong. Right. So we don't want to add to our to-do list. We're trying to find ways to energize ourselves, not to make us self, ourselves feel more tired because we do not need that. So the first thing is that a lot of us think we don't have time for hobbies. We don't have time to prioritize fun. Even if you're convinced by the argument that it is important, you might think, I still can't do it. I've got too much on my plate. So the first thing I would say is that once you really start to focus on that fake fun concept and identify the things you're doing with your leisure time, that actually, if you reflect on them, are wastes of time, you're going to clear up a lot of space. That happened to me personally when I wrote my last book, How to Break Up With Your Phone, started spending less time on my phone. All of a sudden, I ended up with all this free time. 
and I didn't know what to do with it. And that's what led to this new book because I decided I was going to start playing guitar in my case. And that ended up being this wonderful experience that led to this um, concept of fun in me writing the book. So I'd say first reclaim some time that you're currently wasting because there actually is probably more that you think. And then I would just start by noticing opportunities to be playful or connect with someone or just be engaged and present in your everyday life because there's more of those than we realize. And then, yeah, just ask yourself, the, the question that launched this book for me was just, what's something I always I want to do, supposedly don't have time for? Can you and say that, say that one more time, Catherine? You, you kind of cut a cut out there. Can you ask what that question again? Sure. Yeah. What is something you always say you want to do, but you supposedly don't have time for? Ask yourself that question and then try one of those things <laughs> and see where it leads you. And I also say, you know, do things that you get a kick out of. We don't get a kick out of enough as adults. Like, like allow yourself permission to delight to actually enjoy your existence, to not focus only on the negative. There's plenty of negative things to focus on. There's also a lot of positive stuff. It just takes a bit of training to reorient ourselves to appreciate that. And I'm not being a Pollyanna, but I'm, but there really is a value in paying equal attention to the things that, stre- that don't stress us out, that nourish us, as we do to the things that do stress us out. I think, Catherine, I can hear people saying when they read the title of your book and they're saying to go out and do things and clear up time, there's that idea as an adult, and I feel it uh, often, where you're just like, I don't have time. I can't get to that. I've got too much stuff going on. I've got a to-do list that's a mile long of things that I don't get to normally. Um, so how am I going to figure out that time? Now, yeah, you, using your phone less is one part of it. But like, how, how does a person who has a real job, unlike me, and actually works hard, how do they find this time? Well, recognize, first of all, it's going to help you become more productive. So you might think, no, what I need to do is keep my nose to the grindstone and just, what, email people all day. Instead, when you're feeling burned out, it's actually much more nourishing, refreshing, and productivity boosting to take a break and do something else. So recognize there's a productivity aspect there. And then I would say you really do, I mean, you do have to put a, you do have to put work into fun guys in the sense that if you don't prioritize something, it's not going to happen, especially if you're facing a lot of external demands. So I do think we need to recognize the importance of fun, both for our physical and mental health, and then make a point to prioritize it. Just as an example from my own life, I get a lot of joy and fun from playing music with friends. I'm also very cautious when it comes to the pandemic. And so you might think that that might not have been possible, say, in the winter, but we made it possible We just bought really heavy jackets and I got a heat lamp and a lot of hot hand warmers and we stood outside at like 15 feet apart and we played all winter. And I can tell you that took work and was completely absurd and it helped me weather the winter of 2020. So I'd say once you choose to make it a priority, you then make it happen. And once you start to taste the benefits for yourself and feel what that feels like, you will find yourself intrinsically motivated to continue. So I think the hardest thing is that first step. I'll but, do a fun intervention for you, Stu. We can do a fun intervention. A fun intervention. I like it. I, 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 that's, uh, that, I need it. I think I do need it. Because I, I, you know, I, there are things that I do that I think that are fun. And I would describe, you know, we do a lot of fun things with the kids and all those things. But like you, you don't, think about this. I don't think adults think about this very often. You might think about a vacation. You might think about an event that you're going to. Maybe you hit a concert every once in a while or whatever, but you don't think about working this stuff into your life. I was fascinated by your story of learning to uh, to row on the Schuylkill. I, I used to live in Bucks County in PA, uh, and uh, I remember seeing the boathouses there and all the people rowing up and down, and I thought, you know, you think to yourself, that's like, you know, colleges and high schools are out there doing that. You decided to just start it later in life and give it a whirl. You've got to tell people some, some of the details of this. <laughs> First of all, way to pronounce Google correctly. I can tell Thank you from around here because mm-hmm. that word does not look like it's spelled no. or sound like it's spelled. Yeah, I decided when I was, I turned 40 and I was like, you know, I, I like doing things outside. I like physical activity. I see these people rowing all the time. I'm on the rowing machine all the time because I've got bad knees. So I do that just to exercise, but it is so boring. So why don't I try actually rowing? So I had this hilarious series of lessons with this young man named Brian, whom I had a very funny relationship with. We just gave each other, you know, flack over the megaphone. I just find things to be funnier over megaphones. That's something else I just for myself. So he'd be like, try harder, you know, and I would just find it. So you're doing that wrong. But anyway, there was one morning in particular that I write about in my book. It was Halloween. It was unseasonably warm and nobody would else was out on the river because it was pouring. And for some reason we went out. Needless to say, I ended up dropping my oar and just somersaulting into the Google. And if there's anyone out there who's from this area, you'll know that that's not the river you want to take a dip no. in. It's, that's all the sewage and the effluent. It's just, 
So I did not get hepatitis. So I'm okay. <laughs> and it was hilarious. Like I really, I had so much fun that I just was announcing to everyone for the rest of the day. I fell into this Google. People are looking at me like I'm nuts. Like, why are you telling me that? And I was like, cause it's so absurd. So I'd say embrace absurdity. And another thing I would suggest is to reflect back on your own life and think about some experiences of past fun that you would describe as having been so fun. And just notice, like call to mind three or five of these, talk to them, you know, brainstorm with a friend or something. And then notice if any themes emerge, like what were you doing? Where were you? Who are you with? And that helps you pull out what I'm referring to fun, which are the people and the activities and the settings that often generate fun for you. And the reason I bring that up in the context of this conversation is that identifying your fun magnets can help you turn fun from this abstract nebulous concept that you can't plan for that just makes you stressed out into something you actually can put on your calendar. You know, I can't say I'm gonna have fun on Saturday from eight to 10, that's ridiculous. But I can say I'm going to play music or I'm going to call this particular person or whatever it may be. It, it helps you nail it down a bit more and actually make plans. Ironic though that may sound for fun. Yeah, I thought, and I thought what was interesting about the, 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 uh, the Schuylkill story in particular was that the fun sort of just came from your perspective. Like that easily could have been a story that annoyed you for weeks. I fell into the Schuylkill, I got hepatitis, whatever happened. To did not get hepatitis. <laughs> Luckily you did not get it in this case. It would have been a lot harder to take a fun attitude if you did. Um, but like, I, I thought your perspective of it, of just taking it as a funny event and immediately seeing it in a, in, in a comedic light, in a, in a, in a, in a way of, of just saying, instead of just jumping out of the, you know, getting out of the river and just being frustrated all day long, you took it as a positive, you kept going, you kept boating in the rain after falling into the river. How much of this is just perspective? A lot of it is just perspective. I mean, what I encourage people to adopt what I call in the book a fun mindset, which is an adaptation of a growth mindset, but basically opening yourself to opportunities for fun that already exist. You know, it doesn't need to be much. And a lot of it does have to do with our attitude because you're right. Like in my past as a you know, a perfectionist, I could definitely see a situation in which the same thing would have happened. And I would have beat myself up for screwing up and dropping that ore and falling in the river, mm. or just been miserable or embarrassed. And instead, I think if I reached a place where I just laugh at it, it's just absurd. Like, what, what are you gonna do? It was like, I was cold and wet, but then it wasn't so cold when I got out. And it was just so ridiculous. And so funny that I mean, you can tell even now, it just makes me laugh to think about <laughs> that experience. So I think the more we can kind of just laugh at ourselves, the, the happier we'll be and the more fun we'll have. Um, your website is howtohavefun.com. Um, and you go through, uh, you have even a fancy acronym, SPARK, uh, to kind of walk people uh, through this. Uh, we, we're a little short on time, but can you walk people through a couple steps of this so they can get an idea of how to actually do this? Yeah, so we've actually talked about a couple of them. This S is for make space, so you gotta clear some space for fun. Devices are the first place to start. The P is for pursuing passions and interests and hobbies. So getting back in touch with things that you actually want to do just for the enjoyment of it, just for the fun of it. You know, try that thing you supposedly want to do but don't have time for. The A is for attract fun. So having that mindset that fun is around us and we just need to be able to embrace it and laugh at ourselves. The K, I'll skip ahead, is just to keep at it. You need to keep making it a priority. And the R I particularly love because that is short for rebel. When I looked through stories that people sent me in my research of experiences that they had found fun in their own lives, I noticed this interesting theme emerge of this kind of playful rebellion or harmless deviance where people did something a little out of the ordinary that just delighted them in some way. You know, they, they someone talked about having like an ice cream party in the middle of January in Seattle or this one person told this great story about how they were standing on the diving board of their parents' pool, fully clothed, having a conversation with their mother, and they just had this urge to jump into the pool. And they did. They just like abandoned the, uh, you know, what is supposed to have, you're not really supposed to do that as a grown-up, jumped in the pool, hilarity ensued. So just finding ways to do something that's a little bit playfully deviant or out of the ordinary and just make yourself and other people laugh is actually a great tool to start to find fun. Well, uh, people are going to have some time off here for the holidays. This is a great time to get started with this. Uh, the new book is out on Tuesday. Catherine Price, uh, the book is The Power of Fun, How to Feel Alive Again. And you can get your hands on it next Tuesday, wherever you get your books and pre-order it now. Catherine, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. And I am serious. Fun intervention in 2022, Stu. Let's do it. Let's do it. Back in a second. <laughs> Maybe... If you had a glass of wine, you could have a little fun. It's true, I guess. I mean, if you like wine, 
maybe that's what you can do. Maybe you can pursue that a little bit more. Maybe you can try new things. Maybe that same bottle that you have all the time is uh, a little boring. Maybe you need to expand your horizons a little bit. That's why you got to love First Leaf Wine Club. They uh, remove all the guesswork, uh, doing all the hard work to discover great wines so you can just enjoy them. Now, what you can kind of do is you fill out this little uh, quiz on the types of wines that you like. Um, maybe you like sweet wine. Maybe you like uh, Moscato or a Riesling, whatever it is. And then their winemakers sample 10,000 wines a year, uh, which sounds like a Pretty amazing job across five continents. And I hope it's not one person doing that. That would be very busy. Um, five continents, 12 countries. Uh, they select only the best bottles for the club. And the more wines you rate, the more the shipment can be personalized to your taste. There's no contracts, cancellation fees. And if you're not happy with the wine you receive, First Leaf will give you a credit toward your next shipment for a risk-free way to explore an endless array of world-class wine. Join today and you'll get six bottles of wine for $29.95. I mean, it's five bucks a bottle, come on. Uh, that's free shipping as well. Go to tryfirstleaf.com slash stew, tryfirstleaf.com slash stew. Six bottles of wine, $29.95. Try something new. Do have some fun. It's uh, free shipping as well, tryfirstleaf.com slash stew. Well, we're just a couple of days away from the Power Hour. It is Friday, the 17th, 9 p.m. Eastern. Go to stewdoespowerhour.com. Stewdoespowerhour.com. Get RSVP'd for the big event. It's on Friday. Don't miss it. Uh, when you go there, if you get RSVP'd, you'll be uh, entered into uh, to win some pretty fun things. So make sure you go there and do that now, as well as uh, joining us on YouTube uh, for the event. Or if you're a Blaze TV subscriber, you can get it there as well. Uh, it's youtube.com slash stew does America. Click subscribe, click the bell. You get all the episodes for free and power hour. One shot of beer per minute for an hour. Great cast of characters. Chad Prather is going to be here. Half Asian lawyer Bill uh, Richmond's going to be here. Jason Buttrell, Lisa Page, my wife, Sarah uh, Gonzalez as well. It's a great crew. It's going to be a lot of fun. Okay, so um, there's a new announcement out today from Pfizer. They say they, uh, their COVID pill will protect against severe disease, even from Omicron. Ah, so there's a couple of things that's in, that are interesting about this story. Uh, because, you know, I could give you the details. Their study says it's about 90% cut in hospitalization. Um, if true, of course, is, that would be great news. Um, the couple things that people always look at when they see this story, and they focus on Pfizer says, which is really important, right? <laughs> like, I mean, we don't, you know, Frito-Lay says it's going to, you know, make you healthy. Uh, you don't necessarily believe a, a press release from a company like this, and that is important to understand. It is just what they're telling us at this point. On the other hand, it is important to understand incentives here in that, uh, you know, within a couple of weeks, we're going to have more data on this. As this thing comes out, if it's not cutting performance by 90 percent, yes, in theory, maybe they sell a few pills at the very beginning, but then their entire business dissolves. It's much more, uh, you know, th it makes much more sense for a company like this uh, to not have, uh, uh, you know, large studies disagree with what they announce uh, in advance, you know, this, you know, it, there's not a lot of incentive here. They're already, this is already Pfizer. They're already selling the magical blue pill that, that keeps men, uh, in, you know, at nursing homes in the sack for years and years and years and years. They're making plenty of money. Um, so hopefully this is true. We'll see. Uh, it is important to have the skepticism. The other point uh, is that um, I, you'll see a lot. There are some people who are obviously uh, skeptical of the vaccines, don't want to take the vaccines. Uh, there's less skepticism about a pill. And I think part of the reason is and it's something that has never really been addressed, I think, well by either the Fauci's of the world or the Pfizer's of the world, which is people don't like to take treatments before they're sick. And I know if you're a pro vaccine person, you might say, OK, well, that's what a vaccine is. Get over it. OK, but. I think people are much more open to take things once they've actually become ill. And, you know, I, I think there is a there's a particularly with children, there's sort of a, a hurdle to get over there to say, wait a minute, if there is any chance of a negative consequence that comes from a vaccine, I don't want to do that because right now they're not even sick. There's a different calculus, I think, when you are already sick, when you're thinking, you know, this is pretty serious. I might end up in the hospital, particularly if you're someone, if you're somebody who is vulnerable. So anyway, we hope these things are obviously work well. If you have a treatment of your own, I mean, look, I'm not your dad and I'm not your doctor, so take what you want. But it's good to have more things to throw at this so we can get back to life as normal. Back in a second.
So you're thinking of buying property, maybe somewhere a little bit exotic, a little bit different. Now, it could be just an investment property, could be maybe a vacation property. Maybe you just need a change and you want to live somewhere else. You don't like what's going on here, you want to go somewhere else. Well, in Panama, you're instantly about 10 times richer, which is pretty cool because Panama is a high income nation. It's not the you know, sort of dusty third world country uh, some of these areas can be. Um, it also uses the US dollar as currency, which is, is very nice. And every dollar in your bank account in Panama is basically worth like 10 times uh, what it is here. Uh, picture how much you would have in savings if you happen to go, if you, whatever you have here, multiply that by 10. Right now, um, as a fan of this show, you can learn more about this opportunity by getting the complete Invest and Retire in Panama series, including the American's Guide to Living and Retiring in Panama, along with four videos, all for free. Check it out at buypanamanow.com slash stew. It's 100% free for this audience. Uh, just head over to buypanamanow.com slash stew. Get your copy today. It's buypanamanow.com slash stew. Check it out. Andrew Cuomo is awful. Dot com. And now he has to give back his book uh, uh, money. Five point one million dollars. Now, this is an interesting story because the uh, Joint Commission on Public Ethics voted 12 to one for a resolution giving Cuomo 30 days to turn over the money. Five point one million dollars to the state. Um, now, look, he should give that money away. OK, he should probably give it to his victims. Um, but. It is weird. Like, I don't know how they would have the ability to to get him to do this. He's saying he's not going to pay it. He's going to, he's going to go to take him to court on it. And it is sort of interesting. I mean, he worked as the governor. He wrote a book separately from that. Now, they did approve that book deal, um, the uh, the ethics committee. I don't know if they really have binding control to be able to suck back in five million dollars from this guy, probably half of which he's already spent on Camaro's. Uh, so I don't I don't know exactly if they can do this or not. Frankly, they have fined people for bad behavior in the past. But to take back five point one million dollars because they don't think, you know, the book was I mean, certainly it was a travesty, a travesty, a sham and a mockery, a travesty, sham mockery uh, and it should be refunded. But I mean, almost like it should go back to the book company or go to his victims. I don't know why the state should get it. They're going to fight over this for a while. It's going to get ugly. Uh, it's going to be ugly because Cuomo, of course, has always thought of himself as uh, a guy who's in the government. He's going to be in the government till the end of time. And, you know, his big cash out was five point one million dollars. And that's kind of now all he has. No one's going to hire him to do anything else. So it'll be interesting to see if he can protect this money. Uh, if if there is justice in the world, uh, that money should go to literally anyone else on the planet. There are murderers who deserve it more than he does. Back in a second. Still our biggest seller is the Nancy Pelosi Sucks Pen. They are back in stock for the holidays. You can check it out there. I don't know if you'll get it in time if you order it right now. You can always print out a picture of it, and then we'll get it a little bit later. Uh, but uh, NancyPelosiSucksPen.com is the place to go to get that. If you believe that Nancy Pelosi sucks, this is a fantastic thing to have. Anyone who believes that, check it out, NancyPelosiSucksPen.com. And I want to tell you about a very uh, exclusive early access uh, in, uh, thing for you guys uh, today. Right now, it's up on the podcast page right now, the audio podcast page. Anywhere you listen to podcasts, go there. A brand new Christmas song to celebrate our wonderful transition into the world of socialism. A new song. It's beginning to look a lot like Venezuela. It is available now on podcast, free for you. All you got to do is go to wherever you get your podcast, click subscribe there. You'll see it. You know, normally the episodes are like episode 402. This one just says uh, it's beginning to look a lot like Venezuela, full song. Check it out there, wherever you get your podcasts. We'll see you tomorrow.